sorry for the slight delay. I think, I think, um, I think we'll start this. Um, thank you for such a fantastic uh, turnout. There are, uh, there are still a few seats um, here in the North Jury Room if there are people at the back and they um, hope to stay uh, for a little bit of time. We can put some more chairs out back here. Um, good afternoon. My name's Shimon Basa. I'm uh, with Katerina Borsi here, one of the co-organizers of, uh, of today's symposium, Cities from Zero. Um, and we've also been uh, curating the, one of the newly established uh, research clusters uh, this past year, of which this event is, in a way, a kind of um <coughs> third of a series of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, events that we've organized uh, in the last eight months or so. Um, very much, I won't go, I won't redo the introduction. I think the, the premise of the day is probably quite self-evident. Maybe just as a um, as a recap of, of uh, the morning, uh, for those of you that weren't here to, uh, this morning, we had some really fantastic presentations by uh, Neville Mars on, uh, on the, um, the kind of promise of uh, the 400 new cities in, uh, in China and how uh, that promise had already been, in a sense, eclipsed by the reality of, of the situation of, uh, as it were, facts on the ground. Um, Adina Hempel's uh, kind of portrait and portrayal of, of, of Dubai um, uh, experientially but, and also importantly as a, as a kind of series of uh, strategies um, that kind of literally allowed this place to emerge from the kind of zero, zero dimension of the desert. Um, and then the last presentation was by um, Frank van der Saal, who's an uh, artist who happens to use photography, I'm, I stand corrected. Um, which in the end led us to a kind of interesting discussion at the end about a number of things which I'm sure we'll return to later this afternoon, um, but one of which was the, the, the status of, of it, the image and of images for us, as it were, and for them. I think it's almost impossible to escape this binary of us and them. Um, and, uh, and also, so, you know, a number of kind of quite provocative um, uh, statements that... Uh, uh, that pushed us, a kind of collective us, to maybe escape the safety of merely constantly always observing and demanding um, kind of a blueprint of action. So um, this afternoon is going to very much continue in a uh, very in a similar kind of uh, structure. We have three presentations, and uh, and then we'll have a discussion at the end of the day. The pr proceedings of the day will be. Uh, will be translated into a book which we're hoping to um, come out next um, spring, 2007, with additional pieces. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to in invite our first guest this, this afternoon, which is Alejandro Gutierrez of uh, Arab Urban Design. And um, Alejandro is design leader of the new eco city in Dongtan in China, and indeed. That's what Alejandro will be talking about this afternoon. So please welcome Alejandro Guterres. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear with this microphone? Yep. Um, thank you for the invite. Um, I think, yeah, I think what uh, I wanted to do today is to um, go through a a project which is being done, uh, well, I mean, it, it's going to start construction next early next year, but it's a real project with a real client and uh, with a very, very ambitious agenda. Um, and I also wanted to convey a sense of urgency to all of you, and uh, which is a sense of urgency that I think has sunk on me uh, after two and a half years of working on the project and having read and understood and finally seen the Unconvenient Truth movie, which uh, Al Gore or whoever produced, but based upon or around the Al Gore uh, agenda. Um, and I would like to start by saying that um, I would like to change the title of my little presentation within your seminar, um, because there are two very simple statements here that I would like to kind of highlight to you. This is the Minister of State uh, for Environmental Protection in China. I think I have. I, ha I think it's a very compelling idea what it's 
described there. Because uh, when they reach economic development, there's no way back uh, in terms of the environmental damage. Is that better? Um, and uh, out of the Stern report, uh, very, very, again, simple statement, uh, but conveys the sense of urgency of what I would call what everybody should be talking about, which is how we are going to perform better in terms of the environment and in terms of the social implications of the challenge we, we have ahead of us. Uh, and I think Dong Tang, this project that I'm going to talk about, it's only a tiny, tiny little example of what could happen if we all started to get focused on what we need to do in the next 10 years. So in that context is what I'm going to describe this project, uh, Dong Tang Eco City in the, man in the <coughs> mouth of the Yangtze River. Only to give you a sense of scale, which I think you had enough probably. I, I, I was reading notes of the, uh, one of the speakers because I couldn't come earlier. So uh, uh, you had enough because of the presentation that was given to you before on China. But uh, I think there's one, one thing that probably wasn't in that presentation. Uh, and if it was, I will reinforce it. Uh, because of many different reasons, you do have 200 men million people moving from countryside to cities. Uh, we could disagree with the fact that is it good, is it bad, why has it happened, is it going to be that or is it going to be even more than that. Uh, that is the people that are moving from countryside to cities from western China to eastern China to the big cities. Uh, the, the implication in terms of what you guys or probably m most of you are here architects or practitioners on that field uh, of the built environment are that uh, if you take Shanghai planning standards which is 100 square meters per person including residential space uh, social <coughs> infrastructure and commercial space and everything so every that's more or less what they use as a standard when they build new towns and so on and, and when they ha what they have built up to now. It uh, gives you a number of 20 billion square meters. So if you are going to accommodate 20 million pe t uh, 200 million people, you need 20 billion square meters, which is 66 times Shanghai. So in the next 20 years, China has to build 66 times Shanghai if they are to meet the demand of what they know is coming. And what they are doing now is building it in a business as usual way. And we all know what that means in terms of the stress that puts it on the environment and on the social fabric of and the culture of, of, of China and urban areas of China. So the uh, merit of Dong Tang is not a speculative merit, is not a, uh, a project that is it's born out of, uh, let's say, the ideas of one little person that wanted to have a better project, it's, it's born out of what I would say is a genuine intent from the Chinese government to tackle an issue for different reasons, to tackle the issue of the stress in the environment and the problems that resource depletion are creating on the environment because they see uh, the un this problem as a major threat to the stability of China. And that is a very political argument. And because of that they have created policy particularly in, on the energy side, that is very consistent and very appropriate for what they need to address. And Dong Tang wouldn't happen if we didn't have that new legislation in terms of energy in place. Uh, what we are saying here is that instead of what Mies said, is less is more, we are saying more is less. Uh, which is, uh, more is less means that you can put more people, because you need in China, in more compact areas and if you have higher environmental standards and better uh, understanding of the things that make cities less uh, harmful to the environment, then you can have a less harmful environment. So if you have a low, which is I think a predicament that everybody will understand in this room, if you have a uh, Houston type of development, detached houses at two, at 10 dwellings per hectare, that ca causes more pollution than having a more compact and intense environment. And on the other hand, that helps you to uh, 
get more revenue to pay for those very expensive inverted commas things that you're putting onto the site. Um, why have we succeeded or cracked at up to a point? Absolutely, I'm not saying this is the, 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 the solution for all our problems. Why have we somehow or partially succeeded on, on developing this concept is because we've tried to pull together all the aspects of city making into one piece of consultancy that helped to address and respond to the problems at the same time. What you normally have and what the client had at that point when they hired us is that they had one architect coming along, another business consultant coming then the following year, and then a landscape architect coming on the other year, and then someone else coming to tell them some other stories the other year. But nobody had to taken the initiative of putting and pulling all the ideas together and trying to test the feasibility of those ideas and trying to incorporate all the elements into one process. So we were trying to respond very simply uh, what to develop in Dunk Tank. So we developed what you would conventionally call a master plan, then feasibility studies, business plan, uh, land development uh, consultancy, then why to develop it because that rationale is, is, is very important to the local authorities and the regional authorities, and then how to develop it. And most of you, as Hugo knows uh, Shanghai very well, but just in a very small slide to explain where the site is and where Shanghai is, and what are the kind of driving forces of that region in particular. Uh, you all know that Shanghai is big, you all know that Shanghai is growing at a very important rate of, of GDP per capita every year for the last uh, 20 years. But uh, I would just like to say that if you look, um, uh, Shanghai is, is, yeah, the town center is uh, there. If you drive for two hours in a car in any direction, well you can't do that that way, but if you drive in any direction in that, towards that, that side, uh, for two hours and you draw a radii, you have 130 million people living there. And that economy has, the, the, the Yangtze Delta economy has grown for the last 20 years at a rate of 11% uh, more or less. Which if you think about in terms of whatever country you have come from or you live like this one, you can imagine the pressure <coughs> in terms of the growth <coughs> and, 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 and all of that. So Dong Tang is, uh, sorry, I would just explain one more thing. There is a national level project that tries to connect uh, the coastline of, uh, of uh, this Yangtze Delta area, uh, which is this tunnel and bridge plus a highway that goes all, that, all the way up, crossing to the island, connecting the island of Chongming into the rest of the seaboard, uh, um, which has been an aspiration for that region because it's the most deprived, not deprived, sorry, is the most uh, undeveloped area of the Yangtze Delta. So when you're faced with the fact that there is a tunnel and bridge being built and you have an ecological reserve which is just adjacent to our site to the uh, right hand side of that picture and uh, you know that you have 130 million people around there and that they, it's growing at 11% uh, every year you do know that that is going to be developed the whole island so the fact uh, that made us that triggered us to get involved was to produce let's call it a buffer city that protects that bird habitat from the rest of the island develop, being developed. <coughs> and that's what we started to do. And then we started pushing and pushing for uh, a more and more, let's say, um, ambitious agenda in terms of how the city will impact or not on the environment. So the idea is that you have a, a group of clusters that grow linearly towards north uh, that are as far as possible from the Ramsar area, 3.7 to 3.2 kilometers and that will address the issues of environmental protections ce centrally and there are things said there about that. And what I would like to do now is to go very quickly through uh, the comparison that has been very helpful to everybody that has been involved in the project when we say that uh, if you were to develop Dong Tang with the planning conditions that it had approved when we enter into the process that, that is what we call conventional approach city. And the sustainable eco city is what we have developed with our client and the help of the local government and the regional government uh, in order to create a more sustainable environment. So in terms of the social economic benefit, I'm going to go through uh, seven key issues. 
In terms of the socioeconomic benefits, what we were looking at is uh, the concept of uh, uh, more is less. So you put more people there, you create more of a momentum and the scale for a local economy, and therefore you create more jobs and therefore you create less travel. Uh, at the same time, and this is the first time that has happened, we've used uh, eco-footprinting as a methodology to assess different options for the project. Eco-footprinting has been used for assessing the performance of regions and cities uh, that are already in place. Uh, and what we are showing here is uh, Shanghai on <coughs> one hand, Beijing on the other, the business as usual scenario, and how is the sustainable scenario of Dongtang. For those that are not familiar with the subject, uh, eco-footprinting eco would be dividing, uh, it's a methodology that has been uh, developed by the Stockholm Environmental Institute and that's, that defines that if you take the whole population and you divide the, uh, that for the productive land in Earth, you get some, somewhere in the region of two global hectares per person as, an, as a fair share of what you should use for your own life in terms of resources. So, um, uh, what we are saying here is that we are aiming for somewhere in the region of 2.3 for Dongtang according to the, let's call it the design components of Dongtang, the things that you can design in Dongtang. And we think that we can get close to two by adding policy components to this design, which is affecting the behavior of people by price incentives in energy consumption, water consumption and travel. Uh, in terms of, of, of water management, uh, again, the city is performing quite well compared to the business as usual. Uh, one of the interesting things, and this is uh, off the record somehow, and it's an interesting point, is that we've just started to realize that the amount of water, I mean, let alone what you're seeing here, which is a comparison between two pieces of city, no? which is quite straightforward, uh, but the amount of water that the agriculture uh, today uses in the piece of land that we are meant to be urbanizing is higher and, and, and more polluting than the amount of water and discharge that Dongtang will have with 80,000 people on it. And that is a fantastic, fantastic outcome because you would, it's counterintuitive, you would think that uh, because it's agriculture you use less, less water than if you have 80,000 people on the same piece of land. Another counterintuitive argument, and this is again part of the, uh, uh, the process of understanding how urban areas are not disconnected from their hinterland, because we normally think of them like uh, uh, things that are separate, and that the operations that happen to, to, to feed and, and, and produce resources for people that live in cities are quite kind of intangible and you don't see them, you just go to the supermarket and get your food. Uh, we, 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 we've started to look at those connections and what we've come up with, again, on a very traditional discussion that you all have heard, which is about the fact that expansion of urban areas creates the loss of uh, agricultural land and the loss of jobs related to that and that culture and so on and so on. Uh, we are proposing a technology that has been developed in New Zealand which uh, are these kind of, let's call them, greenhouses with, with very high-tech, uh, let's say, technology that allows you to control the type of wavelength you use for growing crops, the water, the, 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 the comp how the water is <coughs> fed into the system. It, it is a hydroponic system. And the, um, how you, I mean, w which gases you put into the equation and, and, and how you can actually grow much quicker the same food you would grow in that, in that same area, which means that if you put a, a city like Dongtang, which is uh, on the region of a thousand hectares of a footprint, you could have a zero impact on food production if you put eight hectares of this technology within the city, which again is very counterintuitive. So on one hand you're producing zero impact in terms of the output of food production on that same area. And on the other hand, you're producing jobs for people that are trained on that subject. No? The, the you have rural, rural, I mean rural people working in the farms today, uh, <coughs> and you would have them, <coughs> again, working on those farms, and not in seasonal jobs, but in jobs that run throughout the year. 
in terms of energy, which is one of the key ingredients of the whole equation, and uh, is that in order for the city to be fully powered by renewable, which is something else that we will talk about, we need to reduce energy demand by two thirds, and that is achieved by design and smart uh, technologies, and uh, additionally by the fact that you have to have price incentive for people not to use energy, which is the opposite of what happens in London. The more you consume here, the, the cheaper the, the unit rate is. So in, in Dongtang, when you go over a, thir a certain threshold, you will start paying more. Uh, and, and that has helped us to reduce energy demand to uh, 600 gigawatt per year in Dongtang, which is two-thirds of the reduction, which means that we can power the whole city with renewables, which means that uh, biomass, solar power and wind power will actually <coughs> completely power the city. Not only the buildings and the industries and the supermarkets and the retail and all of that, but also the transport. We are not planning to power the transport that goes from Shanghai to, to, to Dongtang. But I'll tell you the implications of that as well. So we are, with that measure, we are having a double, a double effect. We are reducing uh, uh, I mean we are having a self-sustainable city and on the other hand, in terms of energy, and on the other hand we are reducing carbon emissions from 350,000 tons per year if you were using energy from the grid to zero. And that is helped by uh, smartly, as I was saying before, but an another example of that is, is helped by modeling and putting the city in such a layout so that the wind uh, in summer and, 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 and uh, winter would help to reduce the demand for energy for, heat, uh, for heating and cooling. In terms of waste, the same story. Uh, and in terms of transport, this is the other, the other component of the story. Uh, because it will be uh, zero particulate uh, emissions, because we will only allow uh, those type of uh, technologies to come into the city, uh, you will be able to reduce further 400,000 tons per year on carbon emissions. So in Dongtang every year you will have a reduction compared to business as usual of 750,000 tons of carbon emissions. Uh, and that is also helped uh, by the fact that, and this is very normal in, in a European traditional city, you have a compact type of development with a mix, with a mix of uses that is appropriate for people to live and work more or less in the same area which is not the case of new developments in China. So how does it look like? Basically, it looks like uh, this for the first phase, which is a group of three self-contained uh, villages in terms of flooding, defense. Uh, sorry, I can't see the mouse. Here it is. Which, oops. Which is, you tell me how far I can go. Is that okay? uh, which is uh, one there. And then you probably will guess the other two, that one and that one. This was another very interesting subject. The, the concept of a town of three villages came out of three main points. One is that we wanted people to walk as much as they could so we could reduce the demand for travel and the energy related to that component. So that we looked at a uh, seven to ten minutes radii for a village center. Then we looked at the uh, commercial facing of this and we realized that business as usual in that sense we wanted to achieve. Uh, uh, phases in Shanghai are in the order between 100 hectares and 300 hectares. So each of these clusters is on, on the region of 220 hectares. <coughs> and the third element is, is a very interesting one which is came out of, we were half, halfway through our process of design and we, we hit um, Katrina in, uh, in, in New Orleans. And one of the, 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 the lessons from that uh, is that you don't want uh, a whole city to be protected by one flooding defense because if that one thing breaks, the whole city gets flooded. So the approach is that you have a cells approach where if one of the systems break, you don't have the whole city flooded. So you have three different flood cells, each one for each village. And over and above that, there is an existing dike here, which is the dike that protects currently the island, which is over there. So we have, we have, in terms of flooding, produced a very complex and sophisticated mechanism that I will come back a bit later to. 
it is a compact city in terms of going from three to eight stories, which is what, again, familiar to, pol to UK policy, but not familiar to Chinese policy, low rise and high density. And it's based on a very simple assumption, which has been uh, uh, studied and carried out very seriously for many years for, from two very uh, respectable uh, researchers, Newman and Kenworthy, which talks about the most efficient energy to density uh, ratio, which is on the clusters of cities that you see in the red area. And it, what does it mean in terms of uh, zero emissions and how we manage that is providing choice, uh, desirability and a unique experience. So people that do not have cars that comply with, it, with, with zero emissions have to stop out of town and take some other type of, of, of vehicle or work or cycle or whatever uh, into town. And people that do have the available technology can come into town and park in certain areas. It's a green city for two reasons. One is that it's quite high in terms of per capita green space, public <coughs> open space, but it's also <coughs> green in terms of the experience of that. It's not a green that, it's, uh, that you can only use on the weekends or once a month. It's green that you can use every day as you go from one side to other. Uh, it's a water city for the reasons I was describing before in the sense that we cannot afford not to have water in the city because the water table is somewhere in the region of 70 centimeters below the ground level and because it's in a delta region. Um, so we had a very, let's call it a, a very important constraint that we think we, we've turned into an opportunity. And what I was describing before is that uh, when we started talking to insurers in Hong Kong about how would they like the city to be designed so that we could insure this thing, uh, where is the mouse? Here it is. Uh, they said uh, that they could only insure the city for five years. And we said, okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, to which our response was, then let's, let's allow the city, every, if needed, every five years <coughs> to change the level of its protection <coughs> against flooding. So that's why these three cells, or the two cells that are adjacent to the existing bund, are 200 meters away from that, uh, from that, uh, existing bund, which is there now. So we offset, let's say, our new bund to that level so that we had a corridor that allowed us, that gave us bank, a, a bank of land to, uh, um, if needed, raise the level of both ends of the, both sides of the, of the, of the uh, protection um, without disturbing the operation of the city. Um, What I want to show you now, very, it's, a bit, it's a bit boring in the sense that it's full of uh, um, tables now, but I think it's interesting, is another component that we use for assessing how to fine tune the master plan and the, the, the let's say, the, the, the performance indicators of the master plan, which is an integrated resource model that allows us to understand the implications of putting more or less people in which form, more, more or less land uses, or depending also which land uses which types of technology for transport uh, and the implications in resources. Uh, so what you will see here is a very uh, detailed description of the transport assessment of this. So you get uh, the business as usual model and the sustainability model. And you can see that uh, the uh, outcome is slightly different there and here with the difference that you have 80,000 and 50,000. So we are still going below in terms of the amount of kilometer travels per person, but we have more people there. And then if you look at, the, um, at this component here, you have um, the, the component of, of, of uh, uh, the technologies and the population are related very importantly to the performance of this, of this uh, outcome. Um, and you have a decrease in overall trips distances. And uh, that is based basically on how you uh, s change from, from one mode of transport to the other, which uh, uh, also is emphasized then by the fact that we are using different technologies to fuel the transport that you need, which is already reduced, which comes out uh, uh, at, at this situation. If you were to develop the city in a business as usual way, your total contribution, as I was saying before, would be on the region of 350, uh, 320, uh, thousand tons, uh, well this is thousand tons a year, this is 300 tons a day or 300 something tons a day. Uh, whereas with 
the proposals that we are putting forward, the only emissions are those coming from cars that are non-compliant and that commute to Shanghai. And this is un not only uh, because of the design, it's not only a, 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 a good business for the environment, but it's also a good business for the upfront costs of the developer because you have much less road length per capita uh, in the development because you need less car, you need less transport, road transport, therefore you need less roads. Uh, and I wanted to just finish by saying that uh, we strongly believe that uh, we can create a development which of course we'll have some, some, not all, of the components of the infrastructure more expensive as capital costs uh, at the beginning, but uh, uh, we can see that the operational costs in the not long term, just in the medium term, already uh, are beneficial for the person that is going to develop this project. And what I want to leave you with is a very simple message. Uh, <coughs> which those that have seen the movie of Al Gore will say this guy is Al Gore or the movie guy that was doing the movie. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I think the fact that uh, not, not the generation, not even the generation of our uh, grandchildren but our children will be uh, having a very bad life or actually not a life at all in this planet because of our short-sighted understanding of what is actually happening uh, just prompts me to say to you there is no time to lose we have to act now and I think this project is only trying to do an example of what everybody should be improving on this is a just uh, a tip of an iceberg and you all have to, uh, in my opinion to work on this as we are thank you Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro. I think. Um, if we can settle down, that would be great. Thank you. I think there might be a few seats still over here in this in this room at the very back. If there's anyone standing up. Um, I think it's um, it's very re kind of refreshing um, in a genuinely, um, in a very genuine way that uh, we've just seen a project that somehow uh, is very much proactive in terms of dealing with some of the spectres that um, th these cities from zero are often accused of um, uh, generating. Um, we as is, um, as it was in the morning, we're now going to um, toggle back to to Dubai, which is also an uh, infamous site in terms of um, kind of so-called uh, complete lack of so-called vision when it comes to ec ecological sustainability. Um, which brings us to the, and I think Alejandro sort of mentioned a policy uh, several times sort of just uh, reinforces the, the kind of absolutely fundamental importance in which actually the, the sort of decision making has to come from that. It, it somehow has to, has to be there. And um, Dubai is a, is a place that um, many of us know uh, is, is subject to, on the one hand, an incredible degree of control. Um, but arguably, one might one might say a kind of uh, a control that doesn't um, that places its emphasis in maybe all the wrong all the wrong things. So uh, just to that's a way to lead into our next um, speaker, which is um, Amale Andreas. Amale, Amale is a partner of Work 
uh, architecture company, a New York-based firm dedicated to the exploration of form through ideas, analysis, and program. Uh, she's a visiting critic at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, as well as Princeton University School of Architecture. And Amale will be talking um, nominally about this notion of control um, and its rela relationship to Dubai's emerging reality. So please welcome Amala Andreas. Thank you, um, Shimon. Also, thank you for uh, the invitation. It's really a great honor to be here. Um, it's been a while. Uh, I haven't been back to Europe. <laughs> um, so I, I would like to, before starting, tie a little bit the presentation to what was said this morning already, and also um, to Alejandro's uh, um, presentation. I think that um, a lot of what and, and a lot of what we talked this morning uh, was about uh, image and, and reality and are we creating critiquing the image or are we critiquing the reality and I would say that the distance is uh, uh, there's a scotch piece of scotch that's uh, uh, attached to the board that was there all morning and I think that this is the distance between image and reality. Um, so it's what, you know, there is a reality beyond the images. And in that sense, Dubai, um, um, although uh, is a hot celebrity these days and it's been scrutinized uh, and regurgitated and analyzed, it's often uh, its image and its speed uh, that are criticized and analyzed. And those are precisely the two aspects that uh, undermine critique, because that's the moment where we formulate that uh, uh, Dubai is an environmental disaster. There's a big motion to create a kind of green uh, community at the moment where we say um, there's no culture, there's a kind of culture city that's being uh, um, sort of thought of. At the moment where there's no architecture, um, suddenly there's a think tank being created, uh, inviting you know star architects and and also young to 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 invent, and its image, of course, uh, since it was initially, since it, since its image was what started and is always jump starting Dubai, it's always changing, so uh, it's very uh, hard to uh, grasp. Um, the other thing. Uh, um, is that um, reality actually uh, moves faster uh, than the, the kind of formulation of it. And it's a little bit what Neville was talking about, the kind of chicken and the egg. Um, finally, uh, we're constantly uh, trying to uh, find the, the new, um, you know, creating a sort of a difference between us and them, East and West. Um, and I think that um, those sort of polarizations are often undermined by, um, um, uh, again, the reality um, of how things are moving. And that's what uh, I will try and illustrate today. So um, Dubai is a starlet, as I said, uh, and we're obsessed with it, or many people are. Um, and usually it's known for its uh, record-breaking uh, endeavors. Uh, you know, it's building, uh, as Adina said this morning, um, the highest, tallest skyscraper in the world, the Burj Dubai, uh, which is uh, expected to be done in 2008. It's known, um, you know, it's always uh, the biggest mall. Uh, this is the Emirates Mall. Um, or the biggest sports city. Um, and. Uh, or, you know, creating this uh, vision uh, made reality with the palm. And it even uh, carries this relentless self-projection and, and promotion uh, to Dubai itself, where in Dubai even the billboards have their buildings expand beyond the frame of the billboard to insist that it's always beyond what uh, you can imagine. Um, yet, um, and, you know, always promoting a lifestyle uh, you know, this is what you are supposed to buy into uh, uh, when you live and, and move to Dubai. And these billboards are really the scale of buildings. So they exist as buildings exist. Um, although, of course, since buildings now are beyond the scale of buildings, you know, they sort of everything is kind of scaled up. Um, 
There, but there's a back side to the billboards, of course. Like there's a back side to images. Uh, 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 and this is the kind of where it's in the gaps between the projected and the, and the built that you can start discovering um, exciting possibilities and sort of, um, you know, you look at this and it has a kind of romantic quality, but you know, we can also bo go beyond the kind of romantic reading of it. Um, Beyond sort of the expectation and this image, of course, uh, Dubai is also uh, uh, like everywhere else. You could think that um, you are in Houston or Dallas or any other of these cities, sort of office parks uh, and parkings, um, um, you know, building a, uh, just totally popping up of the desert in a kind of uh, uncontrolled way. Um, in that sense, it's a very generic city. Um, of course, moving uh, you know through car as a way to experience the city, um, and you know between these uh, um, sort of peaks, you also have stretches of you know Potemkin-like mid-rise buildings. Um, but suddenly, you encounter uh, sort of you know uh, uh, the unexpected, um, um, and you realize that it's not like another city. Uh, it's trying to uh, go beyond. Um, here too. This is the marina, and the the image before was the Bur Burj Dubai. So just to, um, um, I mean, while Dubai's physical form, uh, both built and represent today and uh, represented in the future, uh, can easily be likened, or certain aspects of it, um, to other cities, uh, sort of Las Vegas meets Singapore, etc. Um, it maybe is more in the process and sequence of urbanization that the slight changes and differences are occurring. Um, this is what I would like to suggest today, is that it's the sequence uh, and not necessarily the actual elements uh, that make up the city uh, that might create shifts uh, or open up uh, very slight differences or possibilities. Um, you know, if you think of historically uh, infrastructure was critical, crucial to uh, <coughs> the founding of cities. You know, from uh, r the Roman, uh, you know, militaristic system of the grid um, to the more kind of uh, organic medieval growth um, to even uh, contradictory visions of both. Uh, sorry, Le Corbusier on one hand. Um, um, and Ville Radieux or um, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, embrace of what has become suburban life with a fascination with infrastructure. Infrastructure really um, has always played a key role uh, uh, as the first thing that you lay out uh, uh, in a city. Uh, but in Dubai, um, there's no infrastructure. Dubai didn't start, uh, or, or not yet, of course. It didn't start with infrastructure. Um, and when it does embrace infrastructure, um, so this is, for example, the marina, um, all these buildings are almost done and there's no road to be seen around them. Uh, and this creates a very strange uh, sort of situation. Um, this is another area that's very interesting. It's where the Emiratis, uh, every, every local Emirati, uh, male of course, um, inherits, uh, it used to be 15,000 square feet, now it's 10,000 square feet, in the population growth. Uh, um, um, consequence, and they inherit a plot of land, uh, and this is the area where they live and they can build their villa. And so the, these villas are built literally on the sand, and there's no road uh, between them, uh, uh, and yet these, these villas are, are, are being lived in. Uh, when Dubai has embraced or embraces uh, infrastructure, um, this is a top view of Sheikh Zayed Road, um, it becomes more than connecting one point uh, to another. Um, in a way, Sheikh Zayed Road, this famous uh, uh, highway that uh, you saw earlier this morning, is not just a highway, it's also a boulevard in that uh, uh, it is works in terms of uh, symbolizing what a boulevard symbolizes. Uh, it symbolizes power, uh, order, it symbolizes how Dubai has achieved modernity and it's linking uh, the symbol of the highway as, as, and, as modernity and, and, and the symbol of the boulevard as everything that is traditional uh, in terms of what it symbolizes. And it's a kind of highway boulevard that now is being sort of uh, exported um, 
this is another view of Sheikh Zayed Road. Um, to, on the left was a project we did for Mecca, uh, um, the Mecca Western Gateway, which really looked at uh, Sheikh Zayed Road as a model to create a new symbolic gateway, mixing a highway uh, and a residential, uh, uh, very high density residential. Uh, here, the Sheikh Zayed Road is not even on the um, on this analysis. The uh, sort of longest is 5.3 kilometer, Sheikh Zayed Road is 27 kilometer. It's not all built, of course, yet, but you can imagine that it will. Um, so there are new uh, sort of um, uh, new places of meaning that are emerging. Uh, um. I would say that uh, rather than uh, starting its urbanization with infrastructure, uh, Dubai actually relied on, uh, of course, the, the iconic. Um, through icons like uh, the Burj Al Arab uh, and Jumeirah Beach Hotel, the image of Dubai was born before its reality ever existed. This was uh, four or five years ago, and these buildings were already there. Um, the postcards were there, um, but there was nothing around. Now, of course, it's been built up since. Um, so although one would, you know, there is a kind of supposed master plan if you go to the municipality uh, with traditional land zone uh, uh, uses, but actually I would argue that um, Dubai is much more uh, uh, a kind of peak urbanism, sort of taking uh, what it does to the, you know, from these iconic buildings and actually using the strategy uh, on to, to the entire uh, city itself. So instead of creating master plans, uh, it has developed um, micro planning, um, these kind of peaks of, of density, uh, peaks of urbanity, uh, these islands, uh, as, as Adina mentioned this, this morning, uh, which are totally uh, des planned, designed uh, to the doorknob, uh, totally controlled, usually gated, and of course themed. Uh, because you need content to generate with such a speed. But um, while representation of utopias, uh, whether militaristic or uh, as in the kind of garden city, um, uh, has always constituted kind of self-enclosed, perfectly controlled, uh, uh, designed uh, uh, environment for a better humanity, uh, of course this vision uh, was slightly compromised, <laughs> or, or rather the kind of better humanity was dropped. Uh, here you have Walt Disney uh, first you know, presenting its, its, his plans for, for uh, uh, Walt Disney, and then uh, the new urbanists uh, uh, in America with their gated communities trying to recreate uh, what an American town should be. Um, Dubai has, you know, there is, so there is a tradition of this, uh, these, these kind of gated cities, and Dubai is embracing that in its micro plans. This is a business bay, um, perfectly sort of planned where nothing else around it is really. Um, this is international city. Every, every community is slightly different, but actually they propose the same, uh, living, eating, shopping, etc. And their character is just slightly altered. Um, and, and this is a view of the Arabian ranches. So as you see, it's kind of a completely dense uh, uh, community and then there's uh, absolutely uh, nothing uh, around it. Um, this is uh, uh, the kind of uh, Burj Dubai actual community. Um, and to generate these uh, communities, you have to create difference, not only difference uh, between each community, through theming, through uh, uh, um, not what they offer programmatically, more what they look like. Um, you also have to, so on the right you can see uh, uh, the, uh, the Burj Dubai you know, skyscrapers, uh, but also create difference architecturally. Uh, and in that sense, you know, everything is new uh, in Dubai, but today you also have the new old. Uh, to, because there's not enough difference if you just use uh, a, a narrative. So now time is being used also, uh, fake time, to, uh, to organize that difference. So on the left you have modernity, on the right you have the, the new old. And there is no difference there because of the cheapness of labor, um, which is like slavery. Uh, there's no difference and there's a possibility to make the old and the new really look the same. 
So uh, on the left and at the top, you have the old town of Bastakie. Uh, on the right uh, is um, the sales office of Burj Dubai. And uh, you know, to make, a, to make a difference is very difficult. Um, of course, the last, uh, not the last, but uh, one of the most important means of implementing uh, these uh, and creating these uh, gated communities, these islands, these microplans is through uh, not so much public-private, but really private developments. And what does it mean when you privatize uh, an entire city? Uh, every single uh, island is a kind of private island. Um, uh, this is Amar. Before that was the plan of Nahil. Um, this happens, of course, through segregation. Um, these islands are all different from each other, but they're also segregated from each other. Um, the labor camps are another island, another microplan, uh, where uh, invisible uh, uh, sort of laborers live uh, and work, and they can only move from the labor camps. Um, to to the site of construction, they can't go into the other sort of uh, gated communities. Um, so, but of course, uh, as any city, Dubai trumps his image. So, if this is one of the billboards showing the image of Sheikh Zayed Road, um, this is the reality uh, of of Dubai. And uh, first, in terms of how this reality emerges, is the incredible harshness of building in the desert. Um, no matter how much water is poured into the desert uh, and onto the sand or how much sand uh, is poured onto the water, the desert is constantly re-emerging uh, and constantly present and you cannot erase it. Um, this is uh, Dubai land, uh, which if you've seen kind of glossy images of it is this kind of eco park that's entirely incredibly green and, and but actually the reality of you know building it is starting to look like that and it has its uh, beauty but it's quite different from, from the images that, uh, that are presented of it. This gargantian task uh, uh, requires you know, loads, loads of shipment of materials from all over, including sand. For example, the Palm Islands and the world are not built with sand from Dubai. They're built from sand from Oman because the sand from Dubai is not good enough. So even sand <laughs> has to be imported. Um, Dubai is working, uh, and this is you know, how much energy is needed and being spent to, uh, to create those islands. Um, in fact, um, <coughs> Dubai is working so hard against itself that the more it cools itself on the inside, um, the more it's hot on the outside, uh, literally and metaphorically, literally because it creates these heat islands and so air conditioned is poured, you know, the, the kind of cooling creates this kind of effect on the outside and you really feel it. There's a great difference between uh, sort of moving in Dubai uh, the new Dubai, and then kind of moving in the kind of smaller scale uh, in the shadow of the of the old city. Um, this harshness is only successfully repressed uh, within the tight confines of private space. These kind of micro plans that I was talking about, um, the perfect islands, whether they are interior or exterior, whether they are on water or on sand, um, that constitute Dubai are the only place of kind of where this image really lives. But the boundary between this inside and this outside, between being included and excluded, are only skin deep. Um, so this is the famous snow, uh, the largest snow uh, 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 skiing uh, in, in the Mall of Emirates. Um, and the, this is the difference. So that difference is always there. And honestly, it will never disappear. And this is one of the kind of moments where uh, you, you, you know, the, the reality kind of trumps, uh, trumps the image. And, but it's also exciting that there's this possibility of an outside uh, and of being outside because there is a generic Dubai, um, if you can call it that, um, or, or maybe this is the specific and the generic are these micro plans because they kind of are so overly themed that they all end up looking the same. And these are usually the places where uh, <coughs> local population moves and, 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 and lives. Um, below is a stretch of, uh, called the uh, Jumeirah, which is between uh, Burj Al Arab um, and the uh, Jumeirah beach. And this is actually where the Emiratis kind of work and live. And it's not segregated. It's, it's you know, uh, I mean, it's not uh, a kind of gated community. But um, 
while organic works for urban fabric and is kind of uh, a refreshing liberation from the over-designed and the over-planned, it doesn't really work for, uh, for infrastructure. Uh, Dubai now is, uh, has the, one of the highest uh, case of traffic uh, uh, sickness, or uh, however you want to call it. Um, Gulf News announced, uh, I think it was in November, that school kids spend uh, four hours in the car to go to school uh, for six hours of, uh, of class. Um, and even school buses are late in Dubai. You know, it, kids that are five have to wake up and they can still not make it on time. Um, so this kind of infrastructure-less place uh, is sort of having a, a backlash now. And uh, as a result, Dubai is not the kind of a glowing, glittery resort area. It's actually a really stressful place, uh, which makes it the perfect 21st century uh, city. Uh, uh, this congestion <coughs> is even starting to be felt uh, in those developments. Um, this is Palm Island. You cannot go there uh, anymore. First of all, one of the prawns is occupied by 8,000 uh, laborers. Uh, so not to be seen. Uh, the other thing is the density with which these um, houses have been laid out is so uh, incredible that um, right now there's a kind of panic uh, a little bit in the Khil's offices and they're redesigning slightly because they realize that um, uh, it's much too dense. So this idea that you're selling of a beach of uh, a piece of sea or a piece of beach for, for everyone, a kind of fantasy for everyone uh, is totally undermined by um, by uh, um, the kind of capitalist uh, need to make money uh, and it's not luxurious it's, a, it's it's going to be a really collective experience of kind of sardines uh, sharing a sliver of, of water uh, in between them this is uh, um, the main sort of sort of learning from Sheikh Zayed Road is the main access entrance to the Palm Island, um, which always there's this now distance because it's starting to get built, uh, whereas Dubai has lived in our minds as images. You can see uh, the difference between you know, the perfect model with green everywhere and the harshness uh, of what it, it's, it is going to happen. Um, but that is also, I'm not saying it in a negative way uh, necessarily, there's a reality to it. It's not a state set. Uh, it's real building, the building quality is rising, you know, it has to work with the desert, etc., etc. This issue of uh, congestion, this is the world again. Uh, you can see the density of the islands, you know, you'll be on an island staring at the next, really. Um, this is Marino, uh, and this is the reality. So this uh, congestion that is happening in traffic is also happening uh, uh, in all of these new developments. Um, instead of staring at the lake, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to imagine all of these buildings uh, uh, being occupied. And, um, and what that will create in terms of um, congestion and, and density. But um, maybe the question then is, uh, the fundamental question becomes who is Dubai building for? Um, this morning uh, there was a notion that actually Dubai is a hub that is only being built for uh, a transient population. Um, but the fact it is that this is also changing. Uh, realizing that they needed this population, this kind of 80% or whatever, of expatriates to start staying in Dubai, uh, and realizing the need to sell these properties. Uh, in 2005, finally, the government uh, uh, put out this law linking ownership um, to residency. Um, so although, yes, you can be a resident legally and not live there, um, there is a great movement, uh, a new movement from, uh, you know, uh, a population of more Arab countries moving to Dubai because Dubai represents a place where finally uh, they can uh, build a life. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of joke, but it's true that Dubai has uh, strived on every single war or every single sort of disaster that happened happens in the world around it from September 11, which reoriented all the funds uh, from, let's say, America, the kind of uh, money that was coming from the Gulf countries to America reoriented it to, uh, 
to the Middle East, to the Iraq war, to the Lebanese-Israeli uh, war this summer, to the Palestinians. There's a real movement where actually real people are moving to make uh, Dubai uh, a, a place where they can stay. And how this new population that is investing sort of intelligence and, uh, and, and energy is going to change the city is, is yet uh, not known. Um, these are some more images of Marina. So it's, you know, and this is also one of the questions is uh, um, t for Dubai to really succeed, um, it has to be full. Uh, but the moment it becomes full, um, um, it's going to be so congested and so dense that its image will be completely destroyed. Uh, if it doesn't succeed and it remains empty, uh, it will also be bankrupt uh, and you know will not work. So it's this kind of paradox where no matter what, uh, Dubai will kind of go beyond uh, its image. And um, I mean, in 10 years, let's say Dubai will be 100. Uh, and so this unexpected reality, uh, you know, the only thing one can say is uh, 10 or 20 years ago, everybody was obsessed with sprawl and, and Los Angeles. Today, Los Angeles suburb is uh, the most densely urbanized uh, sort of outer ring of any other American city. And similarly, you know, the critique that Las Vegas is fake and, 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 and kind of just an image is also uh, being completely undermined by the uh, hundreds of thousands of people moving there um, and building the same kind of uh, high-rise living, uh, they call it Manhattanization, uh, but also in the form of these kind of communities as the, as the Dubai Marina. So even Las Vegas is becoming real. Um, And on this, uh, I think the question then become more, uh, so what does Dubai really, what is at stake uh, with these new cities? Um, is it the complete disappearance of public space, possibilities of public representation? Uh, what does it mean to be public uh, or have a public space? Or, or in the case of uh, Dubai, these enlargement, these, I mean, this privatization is also allowing uh, um, certain activities that wouldn't be allowed in an Islamic culture otherwise. For instance, if you consider that uh, a woman's veil is a kind of private space uh, very close to the skin that allows women to move in public space, is once you extend that public, that private space, um, suddenly you can include so many other activities. I mean, uh, you know, the, the kind of drinking or, or uh, mingling or mixing or gender, you know, would not be able to be as easily accepted in a public space. So, you know, there is kind of segregation, but, the, the, you know, there's problems with privatization, but there are also other things that it opens up. Um, other issues are... Um, you know, the issue of infrastructure. Uh, um, I mean, why do we need, why is Dubai uh, now retroactively adding infrastructure? There are plans for roads and, and bridges and, and even, even a metro. Um, when actually these kind of islands could uh, generate uh, a, a new form, you know, new forms of infrastructure, maybe you know, need it, maybe. So what the kind of proposals uh, that Alejandro made, uh, you know, you can walk uh, there or, or um, so there's a lot of questions and a lot of possibilities to reinvent. And, and, and also to tie in with Alejandro's presentation, I think, um, you know, these, you can read these gated communities as gated, but you can also read them as closed loops where, uh, you know, e waste can start to equal food. And, and, and so there, there are th this potential, and it might be that these are the potentials that one, you know, we are talking about vision earlier, uh, that might, you know, one might uh, start to question and pursue. Thank you very much.
I have a problem. Schumer, yeah. I have a problem. I think my charger doesn't really work. Really? Yeah. There is someone who have a, a charger for Apple. For an Apple. Yeah.